All righty, go ahead and take your seats. We're getting ready to start the next presentation. Uh, these presentations are actually provided thanks to the generous support of Dutch Nagel. The presentation is being recorded, and if you ask any questions, the camera will not be on you, but your spoken words will be recorded on the audio track. Um, I'm also going to ask that at this time you silence your cell phones. Your presenter uh, today is Karen Krebs. Uh, Karen Krebs has worked for the Arizona Des Sonora Desert Museum for more than 26 years and now works on her own as an independent contractor. She has extensive knowledge of birds, mammals, des uh, deserts, and animal adaptations and behavior. Karen has carried out research for bats in the United States and Mexico for more than 30 years. She trains biologists on the proper protocol for handling and studying bats. Karen regularly carries out workshops and presentations on bats and birds to groups, schools, festivals, and organizations in the Southwest and Mexico. Her long-term inventory and monitoring program for bats in the Chiricahua Mountains continues in its 20th year of study. She has written articles, books, and manuals for bats and birds. She has collaborated with other researchers on many bat research projects with local government agencies, universities, Mexico partners, and nonprofit organizations. Karen has participated in natural history learning trips in Arizona, Texas, New Mexico, Mexico, Baja, Costa Rica, Africa, Galapagos, and Ecuador. Karen's passion for bats is contagious. Her animal lectures and presentations are exciting and fun. Karen has a BS degree in wildlife and fisheries science from the University of Arizona. Karen's latest books include Desert Life, A Guide to the Southwest Iconic Animals and Plants and How They Survive, Desert Life of the Southwest Activity Book, Explore Tucson Outdoors, and Bat Basics. And then uh, lastly, well, the bass basics, excuse me, bat basics is an introduction to the life of bats in the United States and Canada and their many benefits. So the title of Karen's presentation is the Exciting Nightlife of Bats. She has studied bats for more than 30 years, and you're going to learn more about this exciting and unique nocturnal mammal and how it is so successful as a predator and pollinator. There are more than a thousand or eleven hundred species of bats that occur worldwide. Bats are an important part of our ecosystems and deserve our respect and admiration. Ecolectation allows a bat to fly in total darkness to locate, chase, and capture flying insects. Bridges and other human structures are important roost habitat for many species of bats. And nectar bats visit and pollinate columnar cactus and succulents in our area. Learn more, or excuse me, learn about the 28 species of bats that live right here in Arizona. Afterwards, around 6.30, Karen will lead a car, car caravan field trip to around the canyons to view uh, nectar bat feeding. Limit of eight participants, and this is a paid trip. Please book via the trip registration. Go ahead and give a warm welcome to Karen. Thank you. Uh, it's a privilege to be here every year, and I love coming down here. The lights are okay. Yeah, they're okay. good. And I want to thank all of you for coming in. We're kind of switching gears here. Most of you know, a lot of the talks have been about birds. We're going to talk about that. Um, you know, there should be some time at the very end for questions. So. Um, Hold your questions to the end. What I want to do is um, give you a little bit of information, uh, natural history about bats. Um, what are they? Uh, how do they differ from other mammals? I mean, bats are the only mammal that actually flies. Flying lemurs or flying squirrels don't actually fly. They just kind of leap, you know, from tree to tree. So bats are, are unique in that uh, sense that they actually fly, you know, where they roost, reproduction, 
um, hibernation, migration. We don't know too much about migration, but uh, some of the bats, especially here in Arizona, are, uh, are some of you from out of state? So y'all from Arizona? We have bats here that actually have, uh, uh, are active during the, the winter, especially in the Tucson, the Phoenix area, and they don't uh, hibernate or migrate. So we've got bats that go you know, down into Mexico, probably lay on the beaches during the winter and get a nice tan and then come back up here in the spring. Um, bats are in the crass mammalia, and uh, the group is um, uh, Chiro Chirocoptera, and there's two uh, groups in that. There's the mega and the micro. Now, the, the micro Chiroptera are the bats that we have here in the United States. The mega would be those big flying foxes, the real huge uh, bats that you find in other, other parts of the world. Um, in the introduction, 1,100 plus species. Uh, bats are only uh, outnumbered by, you want to take a guess, what mammal has more species than bats do? We have running around on the ground, sometimes in your house. Mice, Mice you got it, rodents. So rodents have more species than bats, but then bats come along. And that's a lot, that's a lot of species. Uh, bats, um, you know, birds have several movable joints in their in their wing or their arm, whereas bats have the wing is made up of the hand, and the hand uh, the the bones are extended and they give support to that wing. So uh, actually, uh, chiroptera means hand wing. Um, if you're a vampire bat, what do you eat if you're a vampire bat? Yeah, blood. So they don't need as many teeth as, say, an insectivorous bat that would have like 38 teeth. So they have a reduced number of teeth. They have very sharp uh, incisors and canines uh, for you know doing that biting, but they don't need all that uh, the teeth that the other uh, insects eating bats have. Uh, it, uh, most of the bats use echolocation, and I'll talk about that in just a few minutes, but. How do they differ? How do bats differ from um, from birds? Well, I, I, most of your birds are diurnal. What birds would be nocturnal? Your owls, your goat suckers, like your um, uh, common uh, four wheels, things like that. Most of your birds are active during the day, so bats are not really competing with birds because they're active at night. And that's why a lot of people fear them too because they are creatures of the night. A lot of times we don't see them and we do tend to fear things that we don't see. Um, make sure I get the right one here and I'm gonna screw up here. Um, just what I talked about, feathers and fur. Also think about if you're uh, either a bird or a mammal, you have to be able to get up off the ground. So you have to have uh, lighter bones, like with the birds, you know, they have hollow bones, and then bats will have struts. But look at look at uh, uh, the bat here. They don't really have much of a neck. It's just kind of here's the head, and it's just kind of sitting on the on the the shoulder. So they kind of lightened up uh, uh, that, but not having a real long neck. Also, bats don't have a keel like what birds do. You know, all the flight muscles for birds connect to the keel, that big breast bone. Bats don't have that, and that's why they can fit in those teeny tiny places, you know, maybe get into, into your house or your attic or, or your, you know, if you had a, a farm and, a, and a, a barn or something like that. They can get in real tiny because they don't have that big, big uh, keel. Uh, talked about the, the wings, vision and, uh, Vision and location. Uh, bats can see. They're not blind. They can see just fine. They probably don't see colors too well because they're nocturnal. But they, the insect eating bats that we have in the United States, we have a few of the nectar pollinating bats. I'll talk about that in a minute. But um, they use echolocation. So they use this, this very sophisticated sonar, far sophisticated than anything that we have. 
and they use that to fly around. So if the lights were turned off and there was a bat flying around here in total darkness, he'd be just fine because he's actually sending out these pulses from his mouth that go out and hit something and come back to an echo. And then he gets all this information. So most of the bats uh, actually do uh, echolocation to be able to get around. Some of the nectar bats do that too. Um, I, I talked about this before about leavers, you know, they're just, they're not flying, they're flying squirrels, they're just leaving from tree to tree. So bats have that upward, you know, ability to be able to fly and get off the ground. Echolocation. Um, this is echolocation here. And what uh, most of the bat biologists, I tend to be an old timer, so I like to put up a net, catch a bat, and get all the information. Most of the students and scientists coming out of college right now uh, tend to focus on um, uh, the sounds that bats make, the echolocation. This is called a, a, a sonogram. This is called a sonogram right here. And it's on a computer and you can go out and set up uh, recorders at night and it will pick up the sounds that the bats are making. And this, if you're a really, really good bat biologist, you can just look at this and tell which species it is. And so what bats do is they send out these pulses and it goes out um, like this bat right here from the mouth and it goes out, hits whatever it is, either an obstacle or, or an insect or another bat, and then comes back. And they have all, bats have all these adaptations within the ear that um, helps them um, uh, decipher what, you know, the echoes that are coming back and have a lot of adaptations that other mammals don't have. So if you've got a, uh, a recorder set up and it's uh, attached to a computer or it might just have a chip in it that you can take and download to a computer, um, when they let out these, or do these pulses, they usually start, echolocation has three phases. And you have the search phase that might be maybe 25, 30 pulses per second that they're sending out. And then if they locate something, they start the approach. And then that, that speeds up to maybe 50, 60 pulses per second. So when they finally go in for the kill, the, the terminal phase is when they're going in for the insect, the moth, the mosquito, the beetle, whatever they're eating on. They put all of their energy in that. So this is the phase right here where they're going in after the, the insect. So they just, you know, they put out the search, you know, and, and think about all the other sounds in the environment that they're having to deal with. Their ears are adapted so they can just shut all that out. And all they have to do is just focus on their eating. Think about a hundred or a thousand um, bats in a cave flying around. They don't bump into each other. They know exactly where you know, the other bat is. It's pretty amazing. I'll show you a picture of a, of a roost that I monitored for 15 years in northern Mexico in a Pentecost, and it's pretty incredible. 100,000 bats roost in this, uh, this lava tube. Come out, they're fine. They're not bumping into each other. So when you think about it, it's pretty, it's pretty amazing. What kind of um, avoidance behavior do insects have when a bat has this very sophisticated echolocation going after these um, these insects? Do you think they have anything? Most of them don't at all, but there are certain moths, uh, obviously this moth doesn't, but <laughs> there are some moths that can actually detect the bat before the bat even detects it. So it's, it's, it's hearing those echoes or those pulses before they get back to the bat. And so if they do, they're gonna go the opposite way or they're gonna to fall to the ground and uh, you know, not be eaten. A lot of insects just don't, don't have that ability and it's just such perfection that the bats, um, the, the, bat, the ability that the bats have. So um, like I said, if you're a real good you know, scientist, you look at, at this, the whole pattern, these are numbers here, some bats will, uh, start up higher. Uh, most bats will start up higher and then it sweeps. So it's getting all the information in that area. Um, 
big brown bats, for instance, may start at 60 kilohertz and sweep down to 30, 35. So they're getting all this information. But a different bat, a spotted bat, which is a whispering bat, and I'll show you a picture of a spotted bat, it may be much lower. It may be 30, 35, 20, you know, getting, and don't, they call them whispering bats because you can actually hear them. Um, I talked about this. Oh, uh, one thing that's really cool is that there's a bat. Uh, I'm from Tucson, and um, we have a lot of bridges, and, and you know, there's some bridges here too. Some of the bats roost underneath bridges, and um, one of the species, Mexican tree tail bat, tends to be a bat that has very long wings because it's very fast. This bat can travel as fast as 60 miles per hour. It can get up first to 10, 15, 20 feet. I mean, when they when they roost in these bridges and then they go out to eat, they kind of go out in a group and then they take off for the agricultural fields and they feed off the insects on the agricultural fields. So Mexican free tail bats are called jets in the bat because they're very, very fast. This bat right here happens to be a lesser long nose bat. We've got 28 species of bats in Arizona. 26 of those are insect eating bats, and we have two nectar pollen eating bats, and this is one of them. And this is a lesser long nose bat. Look how long these wings are. If you extended it, it'd be way out here. Bats that have longer wings tend to be very, very fast, and a lot on migrate. This is a migratory bat. The Mexican free tail, the really fast bat, also migrate. If you're a bat that maybe lives up in the mountains, or you're in the forest, you're going to tend to have shorter wings. I mean, think about um, uh, birds, like, um, you know, bird, you'll see, um, uh, uh, anyway, think of some of the birds that use forest, uh, I'll think of it in a minute, um, would have shorter wings, and that's because they're not going to run into the trees or the brush. Um, these bats, um, uh, nectar bats, tend to feed on agave, a saguaro, organ pipe, and uh, the flowers are at the very top of the plant. And these bats come in, they go up, get the flower, come down, circle around, and then go back up. Why do you think they're going up and then going right back down and flying low on the, on the, uh, right above the ground? For more birds? Yeah, predators. Those owls are sitting out there watching, you know, waiting for, for the bats. I did a, a project in, we'll go to the next slide here. I did a uh, project at Coronado National Memorial for Luke Air Force Base, and I was watching. They wanted to know if their their military jets, when they're training over mountain ranges out here in southeastern Arizona, if it's bothering the endangered bat. And the lesser long nosed bat used to be endangered. It's all been endangered just now. But they fly, you know, in these mountain ranges, feeding off of these columnar cactus and. Um, I would sit out at night with night vision goggles on and in my lawn chair and watch for these bats uh, to come and then watch their behavior. And I knew all the times that the military jets were going to fly over these mountain ranges really didn't bother them that. But what was pretty cool about these guys, they look at the, um, look at the eyes of a nectar bat and See how the eye is here, and then see how the little eyes are here. If you're an insect eating bat, you're really not using your eyes to hunt with. Remember to use an echolocation. Whereas nectar bats tend to have bigger eyes, like flying foxes, uh, the big blue bats. Um, the hour two species of nectar bat tend to use echolocation just to locate the plant. And then once they locate the plant, they kind of turn it off. So I would sit there with a the vacuum and you know, almost fall asleep because nothing was happening. And then I'll say, I hear the chicken on the bat detector, and I know that bats were, you know, maybe insectivorous bats were fine by. But these guys were using a little bit of echolocation. A lot of your big fruit bats in other parts of the world, uh, Europe and Asia and Africa, they actually don't use echolocation. Most of them don't use it because they've got such big eyes. Um, this is a myotis. We've got 13 species of myotis in the, uh, the state, and uh, sometimes uh, just to distinguish uh, which species it is, 
you might measure the thumb, you might measure, so this is, this is your forearm, this is an elbow, this is, I mean, this upper arm, elbow, forearm, and then here's your thumb. Look how long these bones are to give uh, support to the swing. Look at these little holes here. They might snag it when they're flying through some vegetation or a forest or maybe a predator grabbed at them. This is living tissue here. And it's like saran wrap, very, very strong. So I've captured bats that had big old holes in the wings and even had amazingly broken fingers and they were doing just fine. And so all that heals, you know, they might get an injury where, you know, they don't do that well, but most of the time they do, you know, pretty well. The, the holes are going to heal. I mean, you can see that this one's healing right now. Uh, so this is a silver hair bat. This is a forest bat right here. He's echolocating. And then this is your lesser bone like that. The other nectar bat, the, the way to tell the two apart, let's say you've got hummingbird feeders up in the summer and you've got, they were full when you went to bed and you woke up in the morning, they're empty. And it's like, oh boy, what's going on? Well, you probably have the, you don't have bears or raccoons or something. You, you would have the nectar bats. Lesser bone, those bats have what is, uh, referred to as an upside down bee. They, this is the, the tail membrane right here. So you can see there's a gap there. If it was a Mexican long come back with that, which is our other bat, it would have skin going all the way across. And that's basically the way to tell him. So if you took a picture and he has a gap there, that's a lesser long nose bat. And he's got a little skirt and that's the Mexican long come. Also the rostrums. These guys tend to have a little shorter rostrum than the Mexican people have. Probably more information than you want. Um, okay, you know, if you're you're a if you're an insect eating bat, of course you're gonna be eating insects. But think about bats like um, a pallid bat. Um, these guys, anyone here been stung by a scorpion? Not yet. Good. It hurts. <laughs> I've been stung three times, and it just looks like a needle's being stuck in there. Wherever I've been, uh, uh, when I worked at the Desert Museum, I was. We used to, uh, when I was a keeper, animal keeper, we would have to clean out the, the the place where the water, the drain, and there was usually animal hair. And I was in the wolf exhibit one time and cleaning out the drain, and there was one in the drain, and I got nailed on the hand. Another time on the shoulder. Another time I was in the bighorn sheep exhibit and we had to go through this little kind of tunnel to get out and there was one on the roof and I didn't see it and he just fell down in front of me. It's like, oh, it would have been off my head. These guys eat them and it doesn't even hurt them at all. I mean, they deal with it just fine. I had a pallet bed. I've got a couple of bats of my own that I use for education purposes. But my pallet bat was like, no way, I'm not going to eat a, a scorpion. So she would have eaten a scorpion at all. But these guys uh, eat not only scorpions, but millipedes. You guys see millipedes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, you don't want to be stung or bit by a millipede. Um, here's our um, vampire bat, two tablespoons of blood. This chicken doesn't even know that this bat has, you know, come up. And, and they're so, they're so quiet, uh, you know, they make their little holes and they lap up their two tablespoons of blood. Problem with vampire bats, and this is a vampire bat here, is that they tend to go to the same chicken, the same horse, the same cow every night, and then that makes the animals sick. Not so much. Less than one half or one percent of bats get rabies. So rabies isn't really the issue here. It's that they make them sick by just, you know, going to them night after night after night, lapping up that blood. Uh, look at the this is a good example of uh, this guy using echolocation. Uh, look at these ridges. The ridges, a lot of bats, pallet bats, you can't see it that well on this bat, but a lot of bats will have ridges on the inside of the ear. And that helps the echo, you know, uh, guide it down into the ear where all the adaptations are and the brain. I mean, they can see just with their echolocation, they can, they can see just with echolocation, without the eyes, how fast, they can tell how fast an insect is flying, how, uh, let's say, fat or thick, or how much liquid an insect has. Um, they can tell speed, 
direction. All that just from echolocation. I mean, it's pretty fantastic when you think about it. I mean, all the information that they gather about an insect, like, oh, that was not juicy enough. I'm going to go stop the knowledge. I mean, they can tell all that just with their echolocation. In Panama, you have the frog eating bat, and the frog eating bat actually uses echolocation too. And um, what do frogs do when they get up? When they they're standing on rocks uh, in a creek, you know, what do they do? Croaking. Yeah, croaking away. You know, he can detect it with not only the echolocation but with those sounds too. Now, this poor frog is kind of bad. <laughs> Um, let's see. Here's just an example of a, of a few of the, the um, bats and what they're feeding on. Grasshoppers, a katydid. Some bats love that. Some bats, um, most of them will eat moths right here. These poor moths didn't detect them. Um, big brown bats eat little tiny beetles, those little black beetles that fly around. They eat the, the beetles. There in uh, Baja and uh, Mexico, there is a fish eating bat. And he actually determines uh, that there's a fish that, you know, when a fish and his skin sticking up and there's little ripples, he can determine uh, that it is a fish by those little ripples. Look at these feet. They have huge gapping feet and they also have big cheek pouches. So what he does is grab that fish up, sticks it in the in a, uh, cheek pouch, and they might go on and gather a couple others and then go hang up somewhere and eat that. Pretty neat. I was in Baja a couple of times and on a boat. Well, I was hoping I'd see these guys. Oh, a friend of mine was doing some work in Baja and he was walking on one of the islands. Um, and uh, where there was sand, and he stepped on a rock, and there was a squeak, and he, he jumps off of it and looks, and one of these bats is roosting under the rock. So when you think about where are they going to roost, you know, there's no trees, it's very barren. So, you know, they're, they're very smart to, that one, you know, he was okay, but, you know, dug a little hole underneath the rock. Uh, plant and fruit lovers here. Uh, most of the bats in, let's say, other parts, South America, uh, you know, Africa, Asia, any fruit bats um, are really important pollinators of some uh, bananas and almonds and all kinds of berries. And most of the bats don't want, unfortunately, a lot of them are killed because the, the farmers think that the bats are, are um, you know, taking their their fruit, their vegetables, whatever. But most of the bats just want the squashy. I don't know about you, I don't like squashy fruit. I want my fruit to be real firm. And the bats want kind of squashy, soft fruit. So they're really not competing with the farmers. You know, they're, they're getting the, the rotten stuff, the stuff that's a little bit older. A lot of uh, farmers will, will not only kill them, we've got some major fruit bats in the world, but they'll also eat them. Okay, this is uh, this is a good a good picture of the other nectar bat that we have. Um, well, you can't see all the the. Um, he's kind of he does have a skirt, but it's not showing there. But this is a good picture of a rostrum. The rostrum or the the you know the nose area tends to be long and pointed. These are um, our um, uh, lesser long nosed bats here. This is a bat I captured in uh, Alamo, Sonora. I was doing some work down there working with, with the government, and there was a, a ranch down there that they let me do some bit. They had some big, huge big trees, and this bat feeds on the bigs. Um, look at this, uh, look at his huge nose. I mean, a lot of fruit bats have huge and beef noses that they'll use to you know, locate their food. This little guy right here, this is a, a pup of a lesser long-nosed bat. And the, the a roost that I used to monitor for 15 years in northern Arizona, they would hang up just on the top. And their, um, their crawls are such that they can just hang and sleep and not have to worry about it. Um, when they hold on and the suspended weight 
of the bat, it will tend to make those calls close or to hold on to the boost that they're direction boosting is kind of the opposite of what, of what birds have. Um, this is the roost and um, these are researchers uh, that uh, Rodrigo Medellin is from Mexico City and then he's got some students with him and she's the, uh, Dr. Brasco used to be my supervisor for this research. We will make a trip in May down to, um, I mean this is what this place looks like I mean, there's absolutely nothing, I mean, there's not really anything on this for these bats to eat, and yet females want to be in this lava tube on underground, at least 100,000 plus bats, because it's a warm roost, and when females have their young, and they're called pups, they need a warm roost to develop and to survive, so the roost is, uh, here I am, I've got my, I used to set up my cameras, and film it and then send it to Mexico City so they can count it. But it's just lava and, and it's all underground. It's kind of creepy to go in with all these insects and it's so, so warm. I mean, it's like 85, 90 degrees in there. But that's what the babies need to, to be able to develop and, and to grow. They want those warm, warm roots. So bats from uh, southern Mexico come all the way up to the north to this uh, roost. Now the females, when they go out at night, they have to come, they either have to go east in Mexico or they have to go north and come into the United States. Any of you been to organ pie? Yeah, that's where a lot of them come in and they'll feed on the organ pie or the saguaro, um, the columna or cactus there. There's just nothing for these guys to eat. So they're traveling and remember they have very, very long wings and you know, to go 35, 40, 45 miles to get food, there's it's just nothing but all for these guys. It's pretty incredible. Um, you know, these guys, of course, um, insect um, control is very, very important. I don't know about you, but I don't like mosquitoes. Mosquitoes love me, but I don't like them. And bats eat a lot of mosquitoes. Um, they eat a lot of other, you know, think about the, the uh, beetles, the flying moths, flying ants, uh, the Mexican pretails like the flying ants, so they go after swarms of insects over agricultural fields, they'll, they'll feed on the flying ants. Um, so the, the insect is very, very important. Think about the nectar and fruit and pollen bats, how, you know, how we're losing a lot of, in the tropics, a lot of the, the forest, and these guys are eating fruit and they're defecating, and you know, the seed dispersal is very, very um, and then think about also the um, pollination and uh, the, the fruits and the, you know that the bats uh, will pollinate and, and you know, feed on when they're so mushy and soft. Um, bats occur all, all over the world except for the far Arctic or maybe some isolated islands where they just can't you know, get to. But uh, they roost. Uh, they'll roost in caves and mines. They'll roost under bridges. This is a bridge right here. Um, this is another bridge. Um, some bats, the smaller bats, the little myotis, will will roost under rocks. We have a bat here, a uh, silver-haired bat, that roosts under the bark of trees up in the mountains. He's black, and he can roost under the bark, and you would never ever. Um, we used to have a lot more uh, wooden structures in the past. I mean, think about buildings and barns and sheds and things like that. A lot more than we have now. Uh, or, uh, you know, wooden structures. You know, now a lot of it's just concrete. But, you know, um, architects and planners are actually building bridges to have little little gaps, you know, underneath to be able to allow the bats. I know in Tucson we had some bridges where we just had thousands of bats roosting underneath them. So even though they've lost some of the, the habitat, maybe the wooden structures, uh, we've replaced it. And, you know, these guys are pretty adaptable. Uh, they occur all kinds of um, uh, the desert, we have a lot in the desert, there's a lot in the mountains, a lot in the grasslands, then about cities when you're out walking around at night and the bats are flying around the street lights. Lots and lots of bats are very adaptable. Um, 
Most bats will have one young. The male doesn't do anything to just breed with the female. It's the female's responsibility to take care of the young. Uh, fruit bats usually just have this as a fruit bat. Look at how big those eyes are. Uh, even the vampire bat, he's, he's, this is a, a pup vampire bat. His eyes are pretty big. Look at these guys. These guys tend to have little eyes. These are insect eating. These are fruit pollen eating. So there's a difference in the eyes. Um, the um, Mexican, this is a Mexican free tail that I was telling you that a lot, a lot of them will roost under bridges and they also roost together in hundreds and thousands. And how does a mother go out and be and come back and, and train her own? I mean, look at these little guys here. I mean, isn't that the cutest little face you've ever seen? I mean, look at these little faces. Um, they usually leave another bat behind to kind of watch over them and take care of them. And then when mom comes back, she knows exactly. I mean, you, you would know your, your offspring if there was a whole crowd. I mean, you would know the bats were too, even if it's a thousand you know, babies, you would know. Um, bat predators, this guy was in my yard. He was not very, very happy. Um, when I worked at the Desert Museum, we were trained to handle the rattlesnakes that came into the museum out on the grounds. And so I have a box and a stick, and I just move it. Um, and a lot of people, when they see a rattlesnake, they just want to kill it. And it's part of the desert. And I, I always, in my neighborhood, I capture them, and I move them away from people just so that they you know, won't get killed or die. So I took this guy far away from the houses. A lot of times snakes will be in caves and mines. If you're in a cave or mine, be real careful because a lot of rattlesnakes will uh, be on the floor of the uh, mines and caves. Owls, we were talking about that a little bit earlier. There's a falcon, a bat falcon in South America that, that specializes in blood bats. And at the um, Penacati roost that I was monitoring for so long, um, you would have to go down into the lava tubes. There used to be, not when we were there, but when we weren't there, a bobcat, female bobcat that raised her young, and they would sit above uh, the lava tube, and as the bats came out, they would slap them down, and they were feeding. She was raising her babies to learn exactly how to, you know, use it, the endangered bat as food. Um, Hibernation, uh, a lot of bats hibernate. I mean, if you've got three choices. You either, in the winter, you're going to hibernate, you're going to migrate, or you're going to stay active. We actually have one bat in Arizona that stays active. It does a, it's a California beetles bat, and they use mines and caves. And what they do is they fill up on food right before it gets cold, you know, have a lot of fat reserves. And when uh, it gets cold, or the roost, that let's say it's raining or snowing, you know, I mean, it's in, it's in the areas like Tucson and Southern Arizona and Phoenix where it doesn't, you know, we don't always get snow. But when it gets cold, it just sleeps in the roost and, and uses up its fat. If the roost temperature falls, it will move to another roost. And it's, so it's very, very dependent on that, that temperature to be able to survive. Now, if you're like a, if you're a silver-haired bat, like this bat here, they're high in migratory. And this is the bat that will roost underneath the bark of trees, beautiful bat. And um, they come through Arizona, they'll, they'll uh, migrate down to Mexico. They come through Arizona, we catch a lot in the Chiricahuas and the Huachucas. But um, you better have enough fat to be able to you know, to hibernate or to migrate. So you've got to make that decision. And Mexican free tails, the ones that you see underneath the, the bridges, um, it used to be uh, years ago when I was studying bats uh, that you just didn't find any in the winter. Now you do. So some of the bats are, are choosing to stay around. And if you, if you live in Tucson and, or Phoenix and it tends to be, I mean, we do get cold temperatures there, which I love. But it's, it's, it's a temperature that the bats can deal with. So 
you know, if they if it gets too bad, they'll just hold up and sleep when it gets warm. I mean, in, in Tucson, we can get, you know, it can drop down to the 30s or high 20s, and the next day be in the 40s or 50s. A friend of mine said that, you know, if it's 40, 40 45 degrees Fahrenheit or higher, there's some kind of insect active. So there's enough insects around here that they survive. Okay. Um, this little guy right here is hibernating and what they do is they just let their body temperature drop, uh, ambient temperature, um, they're using their fat, um, they have to have enough fat to be able to, to survive. This is a bat that's alive and learns to sleep and you see all these little crystals here. So it's very important that they get the fat that they need to get through that. Unfortunately, um, anyone heard of white nose syndrome? Mm -hmm. Yeah, back you know, up in Albany, New York, back in 206, and went down the East Coast and out to the West. We haven't had any bats here in Arizona. When I do my field work, we have to have special uh, overalls. We have to use, we have our leather gloves and nitro gloves on top of that. We have to have our KN95 masks. We have to have hats. It's, it's, it's not very fun doing the research in summer. And thank goodness I work in the mountains. It's not quite as bad. But uh, humans can pass COVID to bats. And that's one of the reasons I don't bring my bat. I haven't, he, he had, I haven't taken him to an education presentation since 2019 because he's old, he's about 20 years old. And bats can live up in their 20s and 30s. But um, we have to be real careful when we're working with the wild bats. And uh, so, um, you know, we have to gear up, and that's because. They're very vulnerable to some of our diseases. Now they're saying, you know, well, you know, COVID, that was probably um, transferred to humans by bats. I don't know. I mean, I think it's the whole market thing, the live markets, you know, in China. I think it was transferred from an animal to people, but don't eat bats. Okay. <laughs> you probably won't have a problem, but, you know, all these un uh, untrained markets that they have in you know, China or some other third world country, which is not good. You know, people pick up all kinds of things. Yeah. Migration, like I said, we don't know a whole lot about them. You know, in birds, we can put um, uh, little indicators on them and, you know, we track them. We can do that to bats to a certain extent. Um, I uh, actually marked some, some bats, uh, some lesser luminous bats, which is a big <coughs> bat down in Oregon Pike in the, in the southwest corner of the state. And three of my bats showed up over here. So um, the thing, you know, with, with, a, with an animal like a bat, especially an insect eating bat that's all over the place out there chasing insects, you have to be real careful what kind of uh, radio transmitter that you put on them. And we do that with birds, we do it. I don't like to do it really with bats, but um, we don't know a whole lot about migration. But there was some bat, you know, some nectar bats at Oregon Pike that came all the way across over here in southeastern Arizona, which is pretty cool. Um, this is a neat bat here. This is a hoary bat. And he, he's called a hoary bat because of the sprosting on his, his uh, coat. And it tends to be a, a migrator big bat it's our it's one of our bigger bats in arizona and also it, it's funny when i work with one of my friends janet she doesn't like them because they're biters they're fighters they're they're screaming their head off you know he's such a big bat he's such a baby but i love him but they, they are cool but they'll hang up in forests and trees and red bats will do that too like if you're in a right here in the area even if you're out birding you know, if you're out on some of these trips, these birding trips in the right parent area, and you see a cottonwood, look up because a red bat will actually roost in the leaves of the cottonwood. Uh, Hoary bats do that too. Some of the bats will hang in the trees, which is pretty cool. Uh, here's our Mexican free tail, the jet of the bat world. Look how long these things are. They could be extended, highly migratory, very, very fast bat. Oh, and gone from the roost, and they go out. Remember, they feed on all the swarms of insects. Oh, uh, white nose syndrome. How am I doing on time? Uh, let's see. You got about 
12 minutes. Okay. Uh, white nose syndrome I was talking about, it's a fungus that affects bats when they're roosting. And you can see the east and the north, how many of uh, these are all areas that have had white nose. But it's been in Texas. It's been, here we are, uh, you know, this is uh, Texas. Uh, Karen, 30 minutes. 30. 30 minutes. 30. Oh, okay. Okay, thank you. Um, it's, it showed up in Colorado about uh, a month ago. So it's getting up here. It's also been up in Washington State. It's been in California, Texas. This area here, except for Colorado, you know, we have it. Uh, I dread it because we have so much protocol right now with our permits. We have to suit up. There's so much that we have to do. We're actually collecting DNA from the bats by, by taking a, a swab and just rubbing it around their face and then we put it in a sterile container and send it to Colorado USGS for them to test. And sooner or later, it's probably already here in Arizona. We just haven't well, you know, found it yet. Um, but it's, look how many bats it's killed. Five point, more than 5.7 billion bats. I mean, it's just very, very sad. We don't have, um, a cure for it. Uh, some of the researchers have, have come up with individual bats that, you know, got over it. It started in Europe and moved over here. And the, and the way it came over here were from cavers, people that go into caves. And we we are very strict here. You can't even, my friend Janet Tyberek does not only uh, workshops in Arizona, California, she goes east and north. She has to have a complete set of pros, a complete set of nets and equipment for all those areas. She can't bring any of it back you know, here or anywhere else. So everything's real strict. So I just don't know what's going to happen if it gets here. It just gets stricter and stricter. And I have to have permits from Arizona Game of Fish. I have to have permits from the Park Service. And we're under very strict protocol. So it will be bad, bad news if it, if it does get here. But we're not going to know if it if it's here unless we get out there and we do the work. And you know, you can do the acoustics and your computer and the recorder. The only way you're going to find it is to have a bat pan, a net, or go into a cave and find it. That's the way we find it. And this bat here. What happens is they they're hibernating in these cold roost, and the fungus gets it tends to wake them up, it gets around the face and body, and the bats will wake up and go out into the winter, you know, where there's snow or, or cold, and will die. And what they are, they're desperate. What happens is it, it revs up their metabolism and makes them use up that precious fat that they've got stored in their body. So it's not a good thing. Um, what happened in Europe was it killed a lot of bats, and then some bats got it and we're okay so that's probably what's going to happen here but a couple of major bats are in trouble right now because of white nose syndrome so it's a very very serious you know bats don't want to be in your hair they don't want to be in your house you know if you get them in your house they're going to fly around they're probably going to land somewhere do not touch them you know with your hand you know, how are they in your house you've probably got the door open You've got a window open, there's not a screen door or a screen on your window, and they don't want to be in your house. They just came in chasing them and said, so, you know, put a hat over it, maybe a piece of cardboard, take it out and let it go. Just don't touch it. You see a bat on the ground, don't touch it. It might be a sick bat. You know, like I said, one half of one percent of bats get rabies. If you don't touch bats, you're not going to get rabies. They're just too real careful with that. Um, less than one in a million odds that you will die disease. I mean, I've handled thousands and thousands of bats. I have an Excel database and there's almost 6,000 entries on it of you know, bats that I have handled. And, uh, I have had my rabies, uh, three uh, rabies shots, and then every two years you usually get a booster. I haven't had a booster in a long time. My tire is pretty high, so I could probably get some bad bats. Um, just don't ever handle them, and you won't. Um, you won't get the disease. So just be real careful.
important if you open your doors at, at night, you know, make sure there's a screen door or a screen on your windows because you will hear from that. If you find a bat that's acting um, strangely, please uh, locate or call uh, a wildlife rehabilitator or your state agency, Arizona Game and Fish or whatever, you know, agency you know, in the state that you're at. Threats, pesticides, wind turbines, habitat destruction, I mean, things that are affecting birds. Uh, and then with bats, it's just ignorance. You know, they're not out to get you. You know, they're, they're very important uh, to our um, to the habitat and all the good things that they do. Um, here's some of the bad ideas. Um, insect control, we talked about that. Guano, it's full of nitrogen. And uh, my, my trips in Mexico, uh, there are people that actually go into caves and mines and gather up the nitrogen and put on their plants. It's, uh, or the, gather up the guano uh, for the nitrogen. It's very high in nitrogen. Good for plants. Uh, very important. Remember, we talked about pollination. So we don't want to have cactus. They're also indicators of health of an ecosystem. You start, you know, think about uh, what happened uh, in certain parts of the country when they started eliminating predators like mountain lions or wolves. All of a sudden, you have this population explosion of deer. Deer coming in, just think about up north. You know, people were complaining about the elk and deer that are coming to the yards. You know, the, the predators are keeping those populations, you know, uh, in control. And we do have hunters, but you know, hunters need to do that legally and with permits. But it's not always a good thing to eliminate predators. These are just some bats uh, that I've uh, handled in my research. And uh, this bat here, this is the, the Mexican free tail, the bat that roosts under a roost. This is our, our grouchy guy, a hoary bat. <laughs> this is a low pipistrel. This is the smallest bat. This is a western pipistrel. And back east, they have an eastern pipistrel. The, the cool thing about it, back east, the female uh, eastern pipistrel have two young. And ours out here just has one. So even within the species, you know, there are there are differences. This is a, a big brown bat. This is a pallid bat. This is this is probably a, a, a Pisonones or a fringed myotis. And this is a Townsend big ear bat. Look at those ears. So these bats have huge, huge ears. You can see we're holding them with the gloves too. These are nitro gloves. Leather gloves that we had. Um, this is a, a fruit bat, and he's got his cheek. A lot of fruit bats have huge cheeks, and they just stuff them full of the fruit. And uh, isn't he a cute guy? Um, this is a red bat. I was telling you about a red bat. And red bats hang up in the riparian areas, and they have uh, usually two young, it's mom and her two babies. This is the California leaf dust bat. This is that bat I was telling you about that doesn't hibernate or migrate. It just stays in warm roost and moves to another roost if the roost changes and in Arizona. And this is a fruit bat. So see how big those eyes are, fruit bats? They're low big. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and this is why they're called flying foxes. That just kind of looks like a fox, huh? Uh, I want to thank everybody for coming. And um, just remember that the bats are um, doing their job out there. And they're not trying to get in your hair or bite you or anything like that. And they're good guys. A friend of mine from Arizona Game of Fish took this picture right down in Alamos. This is the lesser of this bat. And you can see the, the, the space right there, the little upside down feet. Look how long those uh, wings are. The next bat is uh, the guy that was down in Alamos. That's a fruit bat. And um, Bruce Talbert, uh, he's retired now, worked with Arizona Game of Fish, took these pictures of him and uh, uh, is a great photographer. Um, the last book that I wrote is uh, Bat Basics, and um, you can uh, 
get all of my, I've written five books. The Hummingbird uh, book is not in print now, but the other four books are there. This is like $14.95. It's probably in a lot of information about that. So if you're interested, there, there are probably some books out there. I have some books with me if you want to come look at them. But um, Amazon, go to Amazon, put in my name, and uh, make sure the Krebs has two Bs, and my books will pop up. If you should have a question about a bird or a bat, I also study birds, yeah, um, email me and ask me you know, a question. I'll do my best to answer. Anyway, I want to thank you all. If you want to come up with the book, please do that. And uh, yeah, question. Um, I have a bat house that I put up. Okay, good. And I, I know it's occupied because there's one of them that's come down, mm -hmm. but I don't know what kind of bats they are. Yeah, and what probably, they likely are? Um, they could be a myotis. They could be Mexican free tails. We'll use uh, bat boxes, also big brown bats. We use them. When I was at the Desert Museum, I put up like 35 bat houses. And the bats to use them were those two species big brown, uh, also uh, Bellifer, which is a K myotis, used them. And then uh, Mexican free tails. Yeah, I'm down in St. David, so I'm not in the mountains at all. Okay, so it could be any one of those three. So you could have. I'm pretty sure they hibernate too. I mean, not hibernate, they migrate. Yeah, yeah. So you probably have Mexican free tail, big brown bat, or a um, K myotis. Uh, it might be some of the other myotis, but good for you. Yeah, uh, bat houses. If you've got some bats that are hanging around your outside of your house and, and you want to get rid of them, uh, put up some bat houses. But um, go to batcon.org, and that's Bat Conservation International, and they have a bat builder's handbook. You don't have to build your house. A lot of livestock stores will have bat houses, but they have a free uh, bat builder's handbook that you can download, and it will tell you where to put it, how high to put it. Now, you don't want predators getting up in there. It's so you need high. to be real careful. You know, you want it to have an east, yep. the morning sun, but you don't want it to get that western sun. And so there's certain heights and, and places to play, uh, to place the bad house, but that would take care of a problem if you've got bats hanging around, you know, outside. Hopefully they would move. Also, you can use fans, you can use lights, you know, if you've got some bats. A lot of times bats uh, have different roosts. They have a roost that they sleep in during the day, and then they might have a roost when they're out hunting, that they go and just rest, and then they may go out and get some insect food, rest, and a different roost, and then go back to hunting. And then when they're ready to come back early morning, they may go so you know to the to the day roof. so if you've got some bats that are hanging around at night around your door to your buildings it's probably they're probably just resting between feeding now bat houses are a good option yeah uh, would uh, echolocation help bats avoid wind turbine blades you know it's 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 huge. We didn't know that it was affecting bats until they started finding all the birds that had been hit. And you would think so, but a lot of bats are being killed by turbines. So um, there's been a lot of research done on it, and some researchers think that maybe they're attracted to that wine. Maybe, maybe that's similar to an insect call or something. Or maybe, uh, you know, when I put up nets uh, over a water, a creek or something in the mountains, if I put the nets up one night and catch these bats, if I put it up the second night, the bats usually avoid it because they can determine, they can see, maybe not see, but they can detect that net with their echolocation but they're not paying attention the first night. The second night, they're paying attention, so they avoid it. So maybe they're just not paying attention to what they're doing, and they're running into these turbines. Fool me uh, once, shame on me, fool me twice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's sad, but I know they're doing a lot of research. I had a friend um, in Tucson that was trying to find a deterrent to put on some of these wind uh, turbines to scare the bats away or something. So they're still working on it. We're just not quite sure why, with their sophistication, echolocation, why are they running into them? I think that they're just not expecting them to be there. And, you know, 
much cost to them in their life. And are they looking at all at sound as a deterrent? Yeah, yeah, they are. And that's what my, my friend was doing. He was uh, trying to, he, he was testing, and I'm sure some of the research are doing, uh, or are doing this too in the lab, what kind of sounds do bats avoid? And that's what, what yeah. we need to do. What they're doing too, a lot of states are doing, is that they're asking them to shut off the turbines during migration, not only for bats, but for birds yeah, too. Right. Because birds do migrate during the day and at night. A lot of birds migrate at night, just yeah. like bats do, because it's cooler. And so um, some of the states are doing that, shutting them down at, at prime time. They don't want to do that. But, you know, we need to do something to stop. It, it's hard. It's killing a lot of birds and a lot of bats. So they're working on it. Yeah. Somewhere I heard that when a bat gives birth, it's the equivalent of a human birthing a 40 pound baby while hanging from the ceiling yeah <laughs> is that an appropriate comparison it, probably yeah i mean it's like sometimes they hang up sometimes they don't sometimes they'll lay horizontal but birth for any whether it's a a human or or a mammal or something is not such an easy process so i mean baby bats are huge and they've got the wings and they've got the legs and everything. So think about, I mean, you know, as humans, we get help at hospitals or, or whatever, you know, a bat, boy, if it gets stuck, it's, you're done. So, no, so yeah, no. babies are very big. Babies are big. No mid bats. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I've had a feeder for 37 years since I've lived in my house, feeders. Is it possible that I've had several extended generations coming to that feeder. It's a lesser long nose, I believe. I live in Miller Canyon. Um, is it possible that uh, yeah. I've had grandparents and grandkids and grandkids and they've learned where it is over the years? Yeah, I, I definitely. Uh, when I was doing the project for Luke Air Force Base in the Huachucas and, and uh, Chiricahuas, I would sit there with the night vision goggles and uh, I would see, you would know the adults. Adults would come up and boy, that tongue goes right into that hole of the, of, uh, right in, well, either a feeder or with a columnar flower. You always knew when the babies were coming because they would hit it. They would try. I was watching one night and I just couldn't help but laughing. But mom was, you know, doing the circle around and going up. And the kids were just hanging on the top. I mean, any owl could have come up. Yeah. So there were the kids following the moms out to see where the food is and how it's done. But they weren't quite there yet. They were just, you know, just babies. Is and they were fighting, hanging up. Back, like a, a bat that's been there would come back again in a few years, in next year. In yeah, because year, she, next year. Those, yeah, I would think so. I mean, uh, we, I don't know that any research has been done. No transmitters but, or radio transmitters to confirm that. Yeah, I mean, I, I know birds are doing that. I mean, I've got five hummingbird feeders at my house and I, I do know the personality, you know, they're not banded, but I do know the personalities of some of the birds and I'm sure that those birds are coming back. I used to help uh, Steve and Ruth Russell in Sonoida ban hummingbirds. I helped them for 15 years and I did the nets and Ruth banded and Steve took all the data. We would get sometimes the same bird because it was banded the next year, almost on the same day. Mm -hmm. And I remember we got this black chin for like three or four years in a, in a row. It was just amazing because they did a lot of banding during migration in the spring and in the late summer. And there was the band on it, the number and everything. Uh, another thing, I remember this black chin that was so fat that when uh, Ruth banded it and let it go, it was like, eh, you know, two or three feet off the, the ground because it had so much fat from migration. It's like, that bird's not gonna make it, you know, unless it loses some weight. So, you know, they have, obviously he was overeating, but um, yeah, I think, I know with the birds they do, they come back. And I, I bet you, because I've seen, you know, the, the baby bats following mom out to the cactus, she's showing them where the food is and why wouldn't they come back to a sure thing. Thing too, migration is a really difficult process. And, and a lot, I think the 
one statistic was like 50% of everything that migrates never makes it back. I mean, think of what they have to deal with. Think about <coughs> if you're a, you're a bird over the Gulf of Mexico and all of a sudden there's a hurricane, you know. I mean, they have to know what they can and cannot do. That's a lot of birds will land on boats and ships and things like that. And then think about where they're going. Is their habitat going to be there? Are they going to be feeding on insects that have been sprayed with pesticide? And then think about people just shooting and catching them, you know, in Central South America, Mexico. It's tough. Thank you. If you want to come up and look at the book, definitely uh, come up here or check out. Or just go to Amazon. Go to Amazon and uh, all my books are there. Just put my name in and the books will be there. And they're all inexpensive to get. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm in my jacuzzi at night. I'll see them flying around. Yeah. I'm sitting those on the insecticide boards. I can't. Yeah, they are. Out. And they're just ca and they're catching insects. Yeah. That are above my they're, they have the same. Like, yeah. As a fly catcher. So it's I'm cool when they. That was it's, really it's good. It's cool when they <laughs> get over pools. They the just scene. go down, and that tongue comes out, and then they go back up. Well, I don't want them in my jacuzzi. I don't know what that would, what it would do to them, but uh, I have. And them. they know. They know it's. Oh, yeah. But I do have like birds out of some water yeah. things out for them, but yeah, I'm just watching them. Um, but I get pictures like this. I had, how do you get the pictures when they're flying? Um, uh, it's amazing. To well, me. But, um, I have friends that let me use some of their, their images. Right, but and, um, so. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to get some more warm okay. and thought. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Are there any sensors that are